Tyranny, genocide, and bloody oppression filled the land of Uganda during the dictatorship of Idi Amin. Though 85% of Uganda is Christian, Amin gave preference to his own Muslim Kakwa tribe, severely persecuting Christians. It's a known fact that he expelled approximately 70,000 Asians in 1972 and had 300,000 Ugandans killed. His imposing stature, standing more than six feet tall and weighing 300 pounds, caused his enemies to tremble. So notorious was his course of action that he was called the Nero of the 20th century. He closed Christian churches, placing a seal on the doors. By the end of his gory regime that lasted eight years, he had left his small country with a $250 million debt. Most people have heard of Idi Amin. Not many know of a mysterious visit that he received near the close of his reign of terror. It is written. This is Henry Feyerabend and presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today on It Is Written, our subject is Sons of the Mighty. During his bloody tenure, Idi Amin occupied the Seventh-day Adventist Hospital in Uganda and was in the process of closing the Seventh-day Adventist College at Kampala. At that time, Dr. Kelebu was the elder of the local church. On March 30, 1979, his home was invaded by Idi Amin's gunmen who killed Dr. Kelebu in front of his wife and 11 children, driving off with his car. The entire denomination was marked for elimination by the dictator, and the members sensed that a massacre was imminent. With the churches closed, the members of the churches worshipped in private homes. Nights of anguish with deep prayer and supplication marked the activities of the Christians. One night, two well-dressed men entered Idi Amin's office unannounced and said, Mr. President, we have a message from God for you. We're asking you to suspend your persecution of the Christian churches. That's the only way you can have peace in this country. If you continue the persecution, you will greatly regret your actions. For a moment, Idi Amin was terror-stricken. But after the two men left, he regained his composure and angrily inquired, Who let those two men into my office? I want them brought back dead or alive. How those two strangers were able to get by the maximum security of his palace was a mystery. He called his officials and demanded an explanation, but to this day nobody has been able to find an explanation to the mystery. Less than two weeks later, Idi Amin was forced into exile. How did the story of this mysterious visit come to light? <laughs> the irony of the whole situation is that Dr. Samson Kiseka, one of the elders of the Kampala Seventh-day Adventist Church, became the Prime Minister and Minister of Education for the country of Uganda. The fervent prayers of God's people were answered in a dramatic fashion, and though 20, almost 20 years have passed, none of them doubt that Idi Amin's mysterious visitors were angels dispatched from heaven. Kingdoms come and go. Rulers rise and fall under the watch of angels. Angels work for the destiny of nations and are busily involved in the world today. Very few people have any idea of the profound part angelic forces play in human events. Governments do not exist without God's permission. It's an exercise in futility to attempt to oppose God. He's the one who sets up rulers. He's the one who decides when their time is up. God has sent angels to supervise the affairs of this planet. Many great political leaders wrapped up in the affairs of government have no concept of what's happening behind the scenes. Invisible powers are at work on a large scale directing the affairs of the nations. Like Idi Amin, proud Nebuchadnezzar found this out the hard way. He too received a mysterious celestial visitor. We read about it in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 13. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. The king was given a vision of a tall, strong tree which was cut down by a royal woodcutter, leaving only a stump. The conqueror of all the nations, a warrior from his youth who had faced the perils of battle and the terrors of slaughter, who was a terror to all his enemies, was now terrified by a dream. What was the message of the dream? Daniel 4.17 
This matter is by decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the, the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Daniel clearly explained the meaning of the dream to the king. The tree represented Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel explained to him that he would not only lose his kingdom, but he would also lose his mind and would be found among the beasts of the field eating grass like an animal. For seven years he would be stark raving mad. He would be a monomaniac thinking and acting like a wild animal. Nebuchadnezzar had been a very cruel and violent man. In the second chapter of Daniel, we find him ready to destroy a whole class of men because they couldn't recall to him a dream that he had forgotten. And in the next chapter, we find him asking for a furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual to broil three Hebrew youth who would not bow down to his image. He put out King Zedekiah's eyes after he had slain the man's sons before his face. For twelve months after the dream he continued his reign, but one day he began to boast, saying, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Daniel 4.30 The Bible says that while the word was still in his mouth, a voice from heaven said, The kingdom is departed from thee. He lost everything he had been so proud of. He lost his throne, his kingdom, his palace, his power, his majesty, his glory, and even his self-respect. One day he was sitting at the king's table partake, partaking of the fine delicacies of the earth. The next day he was hiding himself in the thickets among the Euphrates River, eating grass like an ox. Seven years later the king was restored to health and regained his position. What was the lesson that he learned? A lesson that world leaders today need to know. Speaking of the God of heaven, this heathen king said in Daniel 4.35, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? What is your impression when you think of angels? Do you think of sweet little boys with wings and blissful smiles? Are they roly-poly cherubs with fat faces? Do you think of sexless creatures floating through stained glass windows? Are they a part of the fantasy world along with fairies, ghosts, goblins, and Santa Claus? Are they wimpish goody-goodies? Most people see angels as less viral, less powerful, more effeminate than what the Bible teaches. When we want to represent an angel choir at a Christmas pageant, we dress sweet young ladies in white gowns. But contrary to common belief, though angels have appeared as human beings on many occasions, there's not one incident in the Bible where they appeared as women. The Bible always refers to them with masculine pronouns. In the Psalms, they're described as sons of the mighty in Psalm 29, 1 and 2 in Psalm 89, 6. They're described as a class of strong ones who carry out the will of God, who gives them strength. Describing the angels, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, in Psalm chapter 103, Psalm 103, verse 20, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Peter, contrasting angels with humans, says that they are stronger and more powerful, 2 Peter 2.11. I invite you to look at a few Bible portraits that reveal the strength of God's angels. During the reign of Hezekiah, king of Judah, there was a mighty king of Assyria named Sennacherib. He had invaded the land with a host reckoned to be invincible was probably it was invincible by all known means of warfare of, of that age. He ravaged every state and had taken away innumerable prisoners besides despoiling every city to which he laid siege. <laughs> this foe was so gigantic as to be compared to a leviathan into whose jaw the Lord thrust a hook and led him back to the place from whence he came. And now he decided to add the kingdom of Judah to his collection of conquered nations. 
Sennacherib sent one of his generals who stood outside the walls of the city and shouted defiantly, You're wasting your time. Your God can do nothing to save you. Our gods are much stronger than your God. Give up. Surrender. Save yourselves much grief. Hezekiah received a defiant letter from Sennacherib, reminding him of what had happened to the other nations and assuring him that he was fighting a lost cause. The Bible says that Hezekiah received the letter and went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord, 2 Kings 19.14. And then he organized an army but he knew that that army was no match for the Assyrian forces. He didn't need that army. God sent an army of one soldier to fight against a whole army. What was the result? Well, we read about it in 2 Kings. In 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35, we read, And it came to pass that night, that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. When they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. One angel killed a hundred and eighty-five thousand soldiers. Sennacherib fled from the battle, and he returned home where his own sons assassinated him. What a picture of power. Little wonder that evangelist Billy Graham says, millions of angels are at God's command and at our service. The host of heaven stand at attention as we make our way from earth to glory, <laughs> and Satan's BB guns are no match for God's heavy artillery. The Apostle Paul talks of mighty angels in 2 Thessalonians 5.7. The word translated mighty comes from the same root as our word dynamite. So we can really say that the power of angels is like dynamite. Moving into the New Testament, we have the story of another Edi Amin, another Nebuchadnezzar, another proud king who defied the God of heaven. He had re relentlessly persecuted the Christian church. He had recently issued a cruel command to have the Apostle James put to death. He had attempted to kill the Apostle Peter, but was thwarted in his attempt by an angel who opened the prison doors and released Peter. In his mortification and rage, he had wreaked unreasoning vengeance on the prison guards. It was the year 44 AD. The story happened in the city of Caesarea on the coast of the Mediterranean. Herod Agrippa I planned a huge party, inviting the elite from all quarters of the city. With pomp and ceremony, he appeared before the people. He was wearing a robe sparkling with silver and gold, which caught the rays of the sun in its glittering folds and dazzled all his fans. He was a glorious figure but his splendid garments of silver and gold covered a corrupt and cruel heart. He began to speak to them in an eloquent oration. The majesty of his appearance and the force of his well-chosen language swayed the assembly with a mighty power. They were dazzled by Herod's decorations and charmed by his deportment and oratory. The people went wild with enthusiasm and showered adulation and praise on him, declaring that they considered him more than just a ruler, more than just a man. They shouted, it's the voice of God and not of a man. Herod took it all in with the greatest pleasure. A glow of grat gratified prides spread over his countenance. But his joy was short-lived. What a dramatic climax to the festival. Read about it in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 12 and verse 23. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. 
Suddenly a terrible change came over him. His face became pallid as death and distorted with agony. Great drops of sweat started from his pores. Suffering the most excruciating anguish, he was born from the scene of revelry and display. A moment before, he had been the proud recipient of the praise and worship of that vast throng. And now he realized that he was in the hands of a ruler mightier than himself. Like Idi Amin, King Nebuchadnezzar, and King Sennacherib, he was no match for the angel. Another New Testament portrait of the power of a single angel is seen on the day of the resurrection. Christ was a prisoner in his narrow tomb. A great stone covered the entrance. The Roman seal was unbroken. The Roman guards were keeping their watch. We turn now to the Gospel of Matthew. In the 28th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we have this fascinating story. We read, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Clothed in the panoply of God, this angel left the heavenly courts. His appearance was as bright as lightning. Who can measure the brilliance of lightning? How many foot candles would it measure? Lightning dazzles and illuminates the countryside for miles around. Brave Roman soldiers that have never been afraid before. Men who were famous for their courage, who had stared death in the face in numerous times, were now trembling. They, the face they see now is not the face of a mortal warrior. It's the face of the mightiest of the Lord's hosts. And brave soldiers swoon away with fear at the sight of a single angel. They watch him move that stone so heavy that it would take several of them to move it. He picks it up and moves it away as if it were a pebble. What might those guards have thought when against the brightness of the rising sun they saw the angel rolling away the gigantic boulder with possibly the lightest touch of his finger. But Jesus could have come out of that tomb whether the stone was there or not. And then they say, Jesus, come from the grave. Hear him proclaim over the rent sepulcher, I am the resurrection and the life. If one angel could cause a number of brave, well-armed Roman soldiers to faint in fear, what would a host of angels do? God has an army. The Bible refers to these angels repeatedly as the hosts of heaven. This is a military term. They're always ready to do what God asks them to do. They are called messengers. They are not, however, little errand boys or gophers who are low on the pay scale and have little responsibility other than to bring written notes or oral requests from one person to another. They are envoys, VIPs, officers in God's army. The Bible describes the hosts of angels as being innumerable. There are so many that they can't be counted. And the Bible uses several expressions to assure us that angels exist in immense numbers. It speaks of myriads of angels, Deuteronomy 33, 2. Tens of thousands, Psalm 68, 17. Thousands upon thousands, Hebrews 12, 22. And 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, Revelation 5:11. And they will play an active role in the final scenes of the history of this old planet. Jesus says they will participate in the reaping process at the end of the world. They will accompany Jesus when he is revealed from heaven in blazing fire. We read about it in the book of Matthew. Matthew 25. Matthew 25 verse 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. The question that remains is, where will you stand? Where will I stand? Revelation 6 pictures the terror of those who are not ready, hiding in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, praying for the rocks to hide them from the face of the one who is sitting on the throne. With God's glory and the glory of millions of angels, 
it'll be a frightening sight. In his book, Angels, God's Secret Agents, Billy Graham tells of a visit he made to the dining room of the United States Senate. He was visiting with different people when one of the senators called him to his table and he said, Billy, we're having a discussion about pessimism and optimism. Are you a pessimist or an optimist? <laughs> Billy smiled and answered, I'm an optimist. Why? asked the senator. Because I've read the last page of the Bible was his answer. <laughs> We're living in a time of conflict between the forces of evil and the forces of good. Bible students are not dualists because they already know who will win. They've read the last page of the Bible. Satan's a defeated foe. He hasn't surrendered yet, but the outcome of the battle was decided at Calvary. And every person hearing my voice must decide which side you wish to join. Because you have the last page in your hand, it shouldn't be a difficult decision. You can join the winning team by accepting Christ in your heart right now. Myriads of angels will be available to carry you safely through to the end. And you will spend eternity in God's marvelous paradise, that beautiful land where no one will ever grow old. Join me now in prayer. Dear Father of us all, on this violent, war-torn planet, when it seems as if might is conquering, we thank you for the assurance that heaven's forces are still in control. 
We thank you for the promise that very soon we'll live in a land of peace. Dear Father, prepare each one of us for this heavenly land, the one which the men just sang about. We want to be part of that land where no one will ever grow old, but will live forever with our Lord in peace and happiness. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, I'm Sean Boonstra. You know, an increasing fascination with the subject of angels is sweeping the whole world. A recent Time magazine poll indicates that 69% of Americans say they believe in angels, while 46% believe they have a personal guardian angel. If you've been in a bookstore lately, you'll notice that a lot of them have had to establish entire angel sections just to accommodate all of the new books. But what does the Bible say about angels? Just who are these mysterious beings that so many people are claiming to have encounters with, not just here in North America, but in cultures right around the world? What exactly do angels do? We'd like to share an important collection of messages by Pastor Feyerabend with you called Sons of the Mighty. It's an inspiring study of what the Bible says about angels, and it's yours just for the asking. Here's the information you'll need to get your own free copy. As a convenience, you may request today's free gift offer by calling our Canadian National Toll-Free Number 1-800-253-3000. Call right now, 1-800-253-3000. Remember, your gift is sent free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the gift you're requesting. Call toll-free now from anywhere in Canada, one 800 253-3000. Lines are open 24 hours daily. Or, if you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H7V4. And thank you for your letters, your prayer requests, and your generous financial support. Write It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H7V4. Once again, the time has come to say goodbye for another week. Mark and I look forward to being with you again next week at the same time. Until then, remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Thank you.